We're going to start a, this is kind of going to be a series for Wednesday nights, and uh, I'm sure probably on uh, Wednesday or two we'll break in with something else. Uh, but uh, I'm excited about this series. It's actually, I'm actually uh, uh, taking this from a course that I'm studying as I'm uh, working through my master's degree. And um, so um, I, I've used a book uh, by, uh, he used to be one of our, our ministers, uh, Dr. Mark Rutland. He, uh, he was uh, president of, of Southeastern College or Southeastern University now, and also uh, went to Oral Roberts University to help pull that university out of the slump. It's just one of the most incredible authors that I've ever read after. I, I've read about all of his books. I think I've read all of his books with the exception. I did find one that's, I guess, just coming out. But uh, this book um, <clears throat> that I'm gonna, uh, I'm using some helps from, uh, and I have to write a report for my classes uh, from the book. And, and uh, as I wrote this, I thought, mm, I put a lot of time into it, and I thought, okay, I, I think I hear, Lord, this is great material to share with congregations. So tonight we're going to we're going to be talking about. In the next few weeks, we're going to talk about character, um, and I know there are some characters, right? Yeah, but we're going to talk about uh, uh, different aspects of character, good character, and tonight we're going to talk about courage, and uh, I believe courage is a uh, good character that that we uh, that we really need. God wants us to have courage uh, and strength, and uh, um, your your c courage will come when you have deep convictions and values. When you value something enough, uh, I think typically that's going to promote courage. I want you to, if we can show that, just like that real short uh, video uh, would be, be awesome. Uh, yeah. Doulas, Greek for servant, one who serves, places others before themselves. Agnes, youngest of three from Yugoslavia. In youth group, she becomes interested in missions. At 17, responds to the Lord. Begins work as a missionary. Where? India. To whom? The outcast. Doing what? Serving them. Galatians 5 tells us serve one another in love, her passions. I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. I was naked, you clothed me. I was homeless, you took me in. Born into obscurity as Agnes, through her services to the poor, we came to know her as Mother Teresa. That might not have been the best choice for older people out here. I expect the younger people would have latched onto that probably really quick. How many of you were able to latch onto that? Is, is pretty awesome. I think all, probably all of us have heard about Mother Teresa. The the dynamic imprint that she has left. Uh, what an incredible woman of God, with courage, and with her courage was laced with conviction. Her courage was laced with value values that she had has. And I believe when we have deep-seated values, uh, things that we uh, that that are important to us uh, as people of God, it's going to move us. Do you know why some people don't move? It's because they don't have deep-seated values. And uh, I put a uh, I put something on Facebook because just because I have to sometimes. Who saw that today? Yeah. Uh, Anybody got your phone? You can pull it up because I probably won't be able to quote it. I was just thinking. <laughs> I was just thinking about, you know, really, who, who are our heroes? You know, people like Mother Teresa, that's a hero. That's a hero worth applauding and listening to. Some people have heroes that are not healthy because of their values. Okay, can you read that, Melanie?
Okay. So what do we put, what do we invest most of our time in? Where do we invest our money? Where is our interest? What do we applaud the most? You can tell a lot about a person by what they applaud the most. You can tell a lot about a person's values by, you know, who their heroes are. If their heroes are thugs on the street, they've got misplaced values, right? It's amazing to me what some people applaud and consider as heroes. We follow what we admire, yes? If we don't admire them, it's unlikely we will not follow them. If we, if we see that something's ugly and, and uh, not good sense and um, wrong, if it violates our values, we're not going to follow those things typically. But, you know, if it appeals to us, uh, then we'll invest. People will invest time. They'll invest their money. We invest our money in what's important, right? Mother Teresa invested her life because she had a, a strong conviction and compassion for the poor. She had a, a, a value system that, that told her, go help feed the poor, get the message of Jesus to them, give them clothes, give them food, do what's necessary to raise them. That's the kind of hero that, that I certainly uh, uh, want to applaud and uh, uh, would want to mimic somebody like that that has those values. And I know that, I know that gifts, a, a gifting and calling uh, may vary in, in uh, all of us, and yet there are some things that's just basic to Christianity, right? Yeah. Okay. So a man's character will determine his fate. What does that mean? A man's character will determine his fate. What, what we do in our character, how we, are we honest or are we dishonest? Are we slothful? Do we just do enough to get by? Are we loyal? Do we have integrity? Um, do we just waste time? A man's character will largely determine his fate. Our choice, in another way of saying that is the choices we make make us, right? The choices we make make us. Not only will a man's character determine much of his destiny, but it also will affect his, his groups, his family, and potentially his nation. Depends, depends on, you know, we may say, well, a, a nation, I'm just one person. Well, one person affects another person, and another one affects another person. It's like drops of rain or drops of, and, and uh, flakes of snow. And, and uh, uh, you can throw a pebble into a, a uh, pond, and you can see a lot of ripples that will go and go and go. And, and uh, how many of you have ever heard of the butterfly effect? Yeah, just the, the effect of a butterfly. You ought to pull that up and do a, do a little looking. You know, we affect people. We all have an effect on somebody. It's either good or bad. But we will have an effect. We'll affect our family, our group that we're in, our workplace. Uh, don't ever mistake the fact that you do have an effect. What you applaud, what you value, what your character is, uh, how you spend your time, how you spend your money. You know, do you know that there's a lot of bad, ugly things that would be put out of business if, uh, if people would quit paying the money? Right? You can name it over and over. So bad character uh, does affect, there's a ripple effect. And uh, so bad ca character, it's taught by our verbiage, right? It's also caught by how, what, we, what we model in our lifestyle, right? 
and it is polarized and expressed in literature and in movies, I feel like that a lot of people do not recognize the, the huge potential of TV and media. They do not recognize that and ignorantly plunge into horrible things. You want to change a culture? Work through the media and the TV because people want to go and they want to sit down. And sadly to say, a lot of God's people will sit down and watch from a poison stream of, of filth and violence and offenses that are things that are offensive to God and God's word and in the name of entertainment or because it's funny or because it's entertaining or because they have some good qualities in their character we sit there and sometimes applaud a murderer or people who do horrible things that's against the, the values of Christians and somebody has written a book about the frog in the kettle what happens what happens you just just put him in and you just gradually turn up the heat a little bit by bit a little bit by bit and before you know it the, the frogs cooked in the kettle and and sad to say a lot of people in the American churches don't have boundaries and priorities and values and they don't stay close enough to God that when when uh, things come across the TV or the screen or media how, whatever or even the person you're working next to that we don't move away or you know speak up sometimes we sit there and sometimes guess what we are drawn into it our own selves and uh, how many of you have, and just, just as an example, because this is the big rave that's coming out, you know, one of the big raves that the enemy is deceiving people right now, and people have become very confused about it. A lot of people have. Uh, but this gay pride stuff, gay pride, proud to be gay, and workplaces are pushing it, cramming it down your throat, and, and all this this, this stuff that's absolutely ridiculous. Um, you know, and that's not what my, my message is. But how many of you, if, if I am watching, which I'm very selective and I'm not trying to be pious, but I'm just, just sharing tonight part of me and my convictions, and I think convictions that we all ought to have, you know, there's, there's very little unless you are watching religious stations, and then you have to be selective as well. Uh, but, you know, a lot of the modern, new, newer movies that's out, if they're not Christian, the world is so, it is so tainted. I mean, how can a person sit and watch, as a Christian, how can a person sit and watch underhanded, filthy jokes and stuff like that and now it's being weaved into the movies of two men or two women kissing and you know being together and even in the commercials for the man yeah 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 that's, that's why I made Eve for uh, Adam <laughs> yeah <laughs> But, I mean, I think if I ask all of you in here, would you, if you were into a movie and it was a good movie, I mean, if it had some really good points, and a lot of, you know what gets me is a lot of movies that has a good story, they're not going to throw those things into a horrible story, typically. What do they do? They build the person up with some good qualities where you're going to actually like it, a good plot line. And what do they do? And then they throw this in. That makes me sick. When, when that gets thrown in, what do you do? I'm going to tell you what, that is so offensive to me, it's cut off. Right? I hope that we all do that. You know what? Otherwise, we'll be like frog in the kettle. 
if we began to entertain ourselves, and just because you know what there's there's a lot of people that are gay and lesbian that have some wonderful traits and and certainly we do not teach that that you know a, a person who's gay or lesbian or an adulterer or uh, uh, whatever the sin is don't have any good traits they could be very likable in a lot of ways even a person that's doing drugs can be very likable can be very kind can actually go farther in helping people a lot of times than somebody that's a Christian would be willing to do but does that make it okay does that make their sin okay you see the enemy is very is very enticing and we need to be aware of the how he camouflages and tries to present sin as though it's okay okay so you know this message is not about you know your a person's sexual orientation but um, it's, about, it's about character bad character I'm gonna say it again bad character can be taught it can be modeled it can be polarized and expressed in literature books or movies it, you know what if we sit down to watch a movie where you know uh, uh, two people that are not married and having sexual relationships together if we sit down and watch that guess what is that any different yeah it's it's more conducive with nature and what's natural I mean I get that but it's still sin it's still God says no to it so you know a lot of this stuff is being weaved in in books that's that's read uh, <laughs> Go to, go to the mall, take a walk through the mall, and look in the windows, which I don't rarely ever go to the mall. Usually when I do, I'm in such a hurry. I'm racing to get what I got to get at the American Eagle, and I'm out. <laughs> but race to see what, what the, the, the dress style is. I'm going to tell you what. Um, quite frankly, it makes me sick when, when a man looks like a woman and a woman looks like a man. We ought to dress the way we are. And you know what I have to say about that, if you're in question about how to figure that out. <laughs> but we've all, we've all been influenced by others. We all are influenceable. Even the preacher is influenceable. You say, Pastor, have you ever succumbed to some bad influences? Yes. I wish I could say no. I wish I was that have always been that perfect saint but I haven't good character like honesty and gratitude and courage can be taught as well if somebody is always about the me myself and I and selfish and don't have an ounce of courage you know what they can model that to their kids and to other people as though that's okay but courage can be taught. Courage can be respected and honored. So I want to talk about courage tonight. Whatever a family or culture allows will be deep-seated within our hearts. And it will breed what we must live with. Did you all catch that? Let me say it again. Whatever a family or culture allows will become deep-seated in the heart and it will breed what we must live with. Whatever we, whatever we tolerate will eventually be, sep, be celebrated. It'll be the, become the norm. If we tolerate it, then it'll be, become uh, the norm, and then eventually it will be celebrated. You see it happening. Do you see it? How many of you see it happening? It's, it is, and, and, you know, and then, if you don't, if you get to the point that you're not celebrating with them, you're the one that's weird. Are you willing to be considered weird by your coworkers or people that you would consider a friend or even a family member? Are you willing? Are you willing to suffer 
for the name of Christ and for what's right. We are called to be the salt of the earth, to be the light of the world. And so we must, we must be careful what we allow uh, and, and tolerate and what we're willing to live with as, as, a, as, a, as an individual and uh, as a culture. Why is it necessary to guard our, our thoughts and our hearts? All through the book of Psalm chapter 119, uh, the writers talk about the word of God, how it is a light unto the path light a, a lamp unto my feet and a light to my pathway all through that you, you find where your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you we are not to allow culture or even family to set the the values that we have or what's right and wrong we ought to be getting our mind continually washed every day because we go out in a dusty dark world right we go out in a dusty dark world and because of that that influence sometimes creeps in and sometimes a little seed will be dropped in there and sometimes we don't even know it if we don't stay in the word of God and let I'll allow the Holy Spirit to search us and see if there's been a nugget of 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 ugly, ugly seed dropped in us to where we become susceptible. And guess what? Then the devil will come and feed that. Do you know there's so much confusion, uh, even in the churches today, about what's right and what's wrong? Why? Why, why is there a need to be that kind of confusion? Why? Because God's people perish for the lack of knowledge. And God's people are perishing for the lack of discipline because many of God's people don't have discipline. You may say, well, discipline is not about your salvation. I will say this. If you don't have discipline in anything, you are going to fall off of the, the wagon. You've got to have discipline about a marriage. You got to have discipline to work a job. You got to have a discipline to take care of your body, whether you're eating or taking a bath or cutting your fingernails. I mean, there are some things that you just do because it's healthy and right. And it, you know, it irritates me probably more than it should to hear people act like you know, just get saved and love Jesus and grace covers it all and you don't have to do anything. I'm telling you, if you are saved and you have Jesus in your heart, you will be doing something in order, if, if you really want that relationship to survive, you're going to have to do something to make it survive. How many of you only kissed your uh, husband or your wife when you got married and then you just went on about your way and you said, I can tell you right now, I've got the license right there to prove it. And that's exactly how some people are doing with a relationship with God. They say, I've got my church membership, I've got my Bible, and I've got my, I've got my baptism certificate, and that's all I need. They think one dose will do you. And the one dose can do you as long as you stay flowing in the dose. But we have to stay put in the stream of Jesus and and. Uh, continue, and that's going to call. That, that means we've got to have disciplines. We've got to be disciplined disciples. A di, a, that's what a disciple means. Jesus said, "Go into all the world, preach the gospel." Uh, I, well, I'm just like way off my notes. I, I mean, I know, and I thought I was going to stick pretty close. He says, "Go into all the world, preach the gospel, and baptize them." You know, and then he says, "And and make disciples of them." Why? Because if, there's, if they're not a disciple, what's going to happen? We said the baby without care, without nurture, will, will eventually die. We have to get the Word of God in us. We have to pray. We've got to be intentional about our discipleship, about our walk with God. We don't just, you know what, you didn't just happen to fall in love with the person you're married to. That was cultivated. Now, some people say it was love at first sight. I don't know if it's love at first sight or, or if it's kind of like some animals at first sight. There's a certain season. I, I don't know. And um, 
uh, the way people switch out about it, it's probably what it is. I know I'm, I embarrass y'all, don't I? <laughs> okay. God help us. The character of the American people has has fallen more deeply into immorality, dishonesty, and lewdness. These behaviors, along with the scandal of our day, are no longer a cultural shock. It is so sad what we see. My, fu- I have Channel Seven news to come up, and you know, because I, I, you know, if the interstate's going to be blocked, I kind of like want to know. But I mean, that thing deems all day long who killed whom and and uh, you know the accidents the drunk driving the the all the drama it, it goes on and on you know the murders and uh the the political rim god help us and that's that's a uh that's really a cesspool i'd like to see it drained <laughs> god help us our world is in a mess why is it in a mess why is it in a mess when there are so many people who say they're Christians? Because a lot of Christians don't have enough courage and backbone to stand up and speak up and they get intimidated and they're back in the corner while the, the hell raisers who don't have the values of the scripture and the power of God in them. A lot of times they're leading the way. If God's people who are called by his name would humble themselves and pray and seek his face and repent and turn from their wicked ways, he says, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. And God help us, don't we need our land healed? We need our land healed. We need our schools healed. We need our neighborhoods healed. And you know what? We need our families healed. We need our church healed. The concept of virtuous living has become alien in our culture. Unless you happen to be a preacher that makes a wrong step. And then you're really blasted. I mean, say, well, you're saying that because you're a preacher. Well, that's the truth. God help us. When people do not have a relationship with a true source of virtue, they will not have the necessary strength to restrain sin. With sin, there is a monstrosity of horrible consequences. The wages of sin is death. Sin breeds horrible consequences. Nobody sins in a vacuum, not an individual, not a family member, not a member of a church, not a worker on the job, not a person in our state. Nobody sins in a vacuum. Sin breeds horrible consequences. Can you tell me what the true source of virtue is? What is our true source of virtue? It's a relationship. It's a a right relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit. God is our true source. And the Bible is, 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 the Bible is where the buck stops. It is the rule of truth. It's for government practice and discipline. It's for correction, for its in, it's in, for instruction in all righteousness that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto good works, to all good works. Every society has its ideas of what virtuousness means. We must turn to the scriptures to identify what's honorable and dishonorable along with the, their true actual meanings. Why? Because we're living in a time, just like the Bible said, where we call good evil and evil good. What some of the most sinful, horrible things are applauded right on our TV networks and on the news. It's upside down, right? Uh, I'm just trying to lay the foundation to actually get the character. (laughs) I might not get more than my foundation. 
So, um, so we must we must use the scripture to identify what's right and wrong, what's honorable and what's dishonorable. Some things God calls an abomination. I don't care who celebrates it with pride. It's an abomination. The nation who forgets God, he says, will be turned into hell. That's what he says. So when a person, a group, or a society ta- whatever they tol- tolerate, it will, it will be left to run its gamut, and the behavior will be approved as the norm and will eventually be applauded even within our culture. And you know what? It's being applauded within many churches. Yeah? True? It's being applauded within many churches. Dr. Mark Rutland states uh, regarding virtue, he says, the quality of life cannot be more important than the value of life. Okay, so uh, I have to, have to think about his, the way he words things to see what does that mean. For example, when a society accepts convenience as the greater quality of life, convenience or what may be pleasant or comfortable, whatever you esteem the highest, okay? If it's convenience, if it's your comfort, if it's your pleasure, if it's pride, whatever, okay? So let me read that again. The quality of life cannot be more important than the value of life. Okay, so when a society accepts convenience uh, as the greater quality of life and convenience as more precious than life itself, the only real valuable people are those who pander to culture, lust, or provide for its needs. Let me, let me break this down. When a person or a culture prioritizes convenience and comfort, over the life, the value of a life of a baby, guess what they do? They make an excuse and abort the baby. Why? Because of convenience? Because of comfort? And it's, and it's happening by the millions. God help us. God help us. Whatever one places as their priorities will take precedence over the lesser. Many within our culture place the highest uh, priority on their comfort, their convenience, and whatever their lifestyle, uh, they want their lifestyle to be. And when this happens, whomever is around are at high risk. If a drug dealer's highest priority is to sell, to make money or to get high, then people become merchandise to them. Let me say it this way. When a um, a hireling preacher comes and makes merchandise of the people of God, okay, let's plow close to the corn. I'm glad my corn's okay. But When a preacher makes merchandise of the people sitting in the congregation because they have tender hearts. His priority, his comfort, and what he can get is more important than the people. That's not integrity. So when one is not valuable to their priority, then he is dispensable. Whether it's the, the... hireling preacher, the drug dealer, or the woman who's pregnant and it's not convenient. Thank God there's mercy for us when we truly uh, recognize our sin and we can repent. No wonder there's so, so much violence and crime. Our compass is off. The compass of America is off. And guess what? I, I feel this and I feel like it's a it's a witness of the Spirit of God bringing a knowledge of the trickery and deceit of Satan. I feel this, this, this very strongly. Um, the enemy's tactic on the church right now 
is intimidation. I know it in my spirit. God revealed this to me probably a couple years ago, maybe three, I can't remember. But the enemy's tactic right now on the people of God is intimidation. I'm not saying that's his only, only tactic because he wants to silence our voice because if he can silence our voice, he can get people, more people drawn into deception. Where does sin start? It starts with deception. Eve believed Satan when he says, Oh, God's just holding out something good from you. He knows when you eat of that fruit, you're going to be like him. Has God really said? What happens? The sin and death starts with deception. God help us that we do not come calm down, that we do not shut up, that we're not backed in a corner to, intimi- be, to be intimidated, whether you're on the job. You know what? I would, I would now I, I get, I, let me just say this. I think that, that we don't need to be stupid, okay? I think we need to use the wisdom of God. But the wisdom of man will will allow you to be intimidated and backed in a corner when you when you need to speak up and because of a lot of God's people are backed in a corner and intimidated or fearful of what's going to happen what would happen what would if listen if we can't stand up there's a there's a scripture that says if you cannot if the footmen have wearied you what are you going to do in the day of chariots when the horses, you know, when the horses are running and chariots are coming, if we are kind of like it compared to what's going to be in the future, depending on a lot of it would depend on probably how much the Church of Jesus Christ stands up as to how far in the future that'll be, because every generation's responsible for that generation and probably the next one that's coming on. If we are weary and afraid and fearful and intimidated with the footman right now, what will we do if somebody else gets in the, the, in the White House? And if that happens, if, somebody, if some of these people get in the White House and all these laws begin to change like some people want them, I'm going to tell you one thing. A lot of our religious rights are going to be taken away from us and we are going to be persecuted, thrown in jail, have, uh, uh, use, have your money will be depleted and all kinds of other things. And if, if, we are going to, if we are going to value those things more than we value what's right before God, we're going to allow intimidation to, to keep us back, silence us, and keep us from standing up. Are, do you all are following me? I know that didn't come out exactly as clear as I wanted it to, but you're getting the message? God does not want us to be intimidated. And I don't think that we have to be ruthless and cruel, and I don't believe that every time we see somebody doing something wrong or saying something wrong, that we are supposed to jump in and correct them right then. I think sometimes that we just need to zip our lip because it's not the timing, the timing's not right. But God help us that we are not intimidated or fearful and that be the reason that we don't stand up and speak up. Are y'all with me? Okay, so, so yes, there are times to keep your mouth shut. We're not the Savior of the world. I don't think, think we have to throw our, our weight and our voice around as though we are heavyweights or we're the only voice out there. I think there's times that, that love shows more of an example than the words that we speak. And by the way, can I tell you about a pet peeve that, that just digs in me? And I hear sometimes preachers say it. So I'll tell you so you don't say it. Um, and it's kind of, I, I can't remember the quote that people use, but basically it's like, uh, uh, just let your life be your witness. How shall, they, how shall they know if they do not hear? The word of God has to be spoken. There's a lot of people that live pretty good lives. 
but living a pretty good life and even living a righteous Christian life apart from telling people you need to repent of your sins and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If a person doesn't do that, they can try to model your good principles, but that doesn't get them any closer to the heaven. So what does the devil do? He comes and tells us, Oh, just, just let your life be the model. You don't have to speak. Guess what? While you're being silent, the world is being deceived and going to hell in a handbasket with a bow tie on it. I, I am not going to get to the character tonight. I can tell that. But hopefully we have laid a good foundation for, um, for the, the principles of integrity and uh, values and good good character. Let me see where else I am. I've done lost. I've done got so hyped up. <laughs> you, you 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 see my passion, and I feel that it is I feel that it is fueled by the Spirit of God, but I also feel like there is a righteous anger, a righteous indignation. There is a place for righteous anger. Do you believe that? There is a place for righteous anger. Study the life of Jehu. I know we're not under the law and we don't go out and blow up, a, uh, you know, places of crack houses. And I know that's not what we do. But God uses some John the Baptist. If John the Baptist was in our world, you talking about, I'm telling you what, a lot of preachers across America and churches would be poo-pooing him. That's true. Because we want it all polished up and nice and presentable to everybody. We, a lot of times we don't want the straight talk that even Jesus said when he said, You are a bunch of whited sepulchers and you make the outside of the cup and the platter clean, but inside you are full of dead men's bones. God help us. What you really love, what you really love, you're going to be passionate about. There's a song that I heard years and years ago because I'm so old. And uh, um, it was, uh, Marina, you remember it because you sang it, Keep the Flame Burning in My Heart. Light, light, my, light the fire, light, light it with the fire of your spirit or something like that. Keep the flame burning. Uh, I wish I had a thought about that I'd pull those words up keep the flame burning is the flame and the passion burning within you have you allowed the culture even that comes in your living room or that you have to be around your family members because we can't we don't we can't just isolate our ourselves from the world I don't think we're supposed to isolate ourselves from the world I think there's times that we have to we have to be in the world but not of the world we have to rub shoulders with the world the thing of it is, we just don't, we, we, if we start fellowshipping with them, that's a whole nut story. But there should be a flame that's burning on the inside of us that we love people so much that we cannot bear to see them going in the wrong destructive direction. That we ache, that we hurt, that we will not keep. How horrible would it be? How horrible? Think of it this way. And this is, this is really not even a full grasp of what I want to say but how horrible if you saw a house was on fire and you knew one person was in there or a whole family and you just thought well you know what they're resting they're sleeping uh, I don't know if they really like me or if they would believe me would you stay outside that house and let that house burn up and consume them would you be more concerned about your reputation or what your neighbors would say or what they, that, that you know, or would you, would you go in and would you try to shake them? Get up, get up, get up, get up. The house is on fire. I think every one of us in here, if we saw a house literally on fire and we knew somebody was in there and they were, you know, it wouldn't matter whether they were asleep or they were drunk as a skunk and mean as, uh, as the a skunk <laughs> what would you do 
You would do whatever you had to do to, you'd bust the door down. You'd do whatever you had to do, I know you would, to get in there and try to rescue that person. There's a beautiful song that says, Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. We are to be about our Father's business. And if we become so like the world, we cannot be the light of the world if darkness is in us. If, it's, if we're just dark, we can't be the salt of the earth if we've lost our savor. If, we're just, if we just blend right in, we're not salt. We're not light. Jesus said, you don't, you don't light a candle to put it under a bushel. Take that bushel off your candle and speak up. Refuse to be intimidated and backed in a corner. Refuse to adapt to the style and the, the, the meandering of the world. Stand up and let your voice be heard. Be kind, be loving, but speak truth. Don't back down for fear or intimidation or threat. If, if Sometimes we worry about little things when many people spoke up and they lost their life. Yeah. Many people stood up for what's right. They've had their head cut off. They've, had, they've, they've been tortured. They've been thrown in prison. Jeremiah was thrown in the pit in a horrible, nasty sewer of a pit. If we, if we would read about the suffering of godly people. But I want to declare to you, this is what I believe. If we suffer for his name's sake... If we suffer for righteousness, I'm not talking about suffering for lack of wisdom or our own stupidity or having a zeal without knowledge. But if we suffer for the name of Jesus because we stood up when we should have stood up, as Stephen stood, as he stood and as the, the stones were thrown at him one after another after another after another, as, as Stephen as Stephen fell down, Jesus stood up. Hallelujah. Who I sense his presence. Jesus will stand up for you. And he'll stand up for me. We must be determined that whatever it cost us, we will not be silenced. We will not be intimidated. We will not give in to fear. We will not give in to cowardice. We will have courage. We will have boldness. We will stand up and we'll speak the truth whatever it costs us. We will not back down. We will not shut up until we go up. We will fulfill our responsibility in this world. Whatever time we have left. I don't know if Jesus will come in our lifetime or not. It seems like it's very possible. <laughs> But when I'm leaving this world, I want to be able to say, like Paul, I fought, I fought a good fight. I've done what I'm supposed to do. I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Whether we have a lot of applause or pats on the back or people who love us, not even the issue. No more than we abort babies for convenience will we um, be silent so people will like us. It's not about us. It's about, it's about souls of men and women getting the gospel out. We must, must be steadfast and immovable.